Well, good afternoon, church family. I want to thank you for this opportunity that you're taking um, to, to grow in your faith and, and to grow in this, in this season where we're uh, apart, but now in the, in the context of home groups, where we can look at each other and smile and, and embrace each other and enjoy each other. But, but I want to begin um, with a word of prayer uh, before we get started into our text, before our, we get into our study. So pray with me, please. Father, you are righteous and good, and you have presented to us your word, and we want to thank you for that. We want to give you our heart and our mind. Father, we're giving ourselves to community. We're gathering. We are uh, opening our homes. We're being hospitable. We are sharing in commonality. Father, we pray that you'll bless this, this community, this believer, this, this person who's involved in these studies, the person who's leading these studies. Father, we pray that all hearts and minds will be open. Father, we ask this through Jesus. Amen. So, if you have your Bible, and I trust that you do, I want to begin with 1 Kings chapter 8. Uh, Solomon has dedicated the temple. It's been built. No expense was spared. A beautiful temple. Grand in its scheme. But at the end of this uh, temple dedication and the sacrifices that take place, in 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 66, Solomon says something particular uh, for all of us to know and to see. On the eighth day, he sent the people away, and they blessed the king and went to their homes joyful and glad of heart for all the goodness that the Lord had shown to David his servant and to Israel his people. They were glad. They were grateful. They were joyful is the word. They had seen the goodness of God. The temple had been built. It had been dedicated. Sacrifices had been made. They feasted for seven days, and on the eighth day, Solomon sent them home, and they were glad to go home. Not because they were ungrateful or were too tired of the feast, but they were grateful that they had seen all that the Lord had done, all that he had promised David, and how it came to fruition through Solomon, through the temple, and they witnessed it with their very eyes. You and I have so much to be grateful for and to, so, to be so thankful, like these Israelites who saw uh, the goodness of God before their eyes. They got to see the fruition and the promises come true. You know, there's a lot that goes on in our life where uh, if we're not careful, we're not looking. We're not looking for gratefulness. We're not looking at the blessings that God has given and dealt to us. And, and thus, we, we, we wonder why we're not happy. We wonder why we're not grateful. We're, we wonder why we while we uh, drudge going to worship God and we drudge being around the church, and, and I trust this isn't you, but there are some who may be involved in this study. They don't, they don't like the idea of church, and it could simply be the fact because they're not looking at the blessings that God is providing them right before their eyes. Fast forward to the book of Hebrews is, is where we are, and, and, and chapter 1 is where it begins, and, and this book in and of itself begins roughly around... Um, 40s to 50s AD. It's somewhere in between uh, 28 to 30 AD and 70 AD. Some, somewhere in between where the destruction of Jerusalem had taken place. And the writer, we know that he knows Timothy based on the text. We know that he did not see the, the things of Jesus, chapter 2. We'll get to that next week. But, but the writer of, this, of this, this letter to the Hebrews did not know and did not see Jesus uh, personally. Things that were told of him. But in particular, they were having to be reminded. They were having to be reminded to look at all. You as Hebrews, you were God's people. You were the chosen of the world, the smallest of tribe, but God favored and God, God blessed and God promised. You see, a lot had taken place between 1 Kings chapter 8 and when the letter of Hebrews was penned. Jesus had come. The church had been established just 15, 20 years earlier, and, and there were some beginning to depart by the pressure of the Jews, by the pressure of Rome, by the pressure of, of, of should we bind the law of Moses, should we bind circumcision where we were God's people, now we follow this Christ, is this the one, the Messiah? All these questions, and they had forgotten all that Jesus had done for them. You see, Jesus had been so great and been so miraculous and so you cannot deny the fact that this is Jesus. I mean, even Nicodemus and John, 
He said, we know that you're a man from God. We know that you've come from him. Nobody can do what you do. We know that you are from Jehovah, the, the Adonai, the one that they loved and beheld. But if you have your Bible, look at Hebrews chapter 1. The way we're going to go about this is I'm not going to go through the notes that you have before you. That's for your home leader to do. That's for you to ask and, and to uh, deal with amongst yourselves. But in Hebrews chapter 1, he begins and he says, Long ago at many times and in many ways, or many portions, your version may say, long ago, meaning in contrast to today. But, but he says, long ago at many times and many, many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. God used to speak in different ways, in different portions, at different times, but now he speaks too. And what you're going to see in chapter 1 is that there is a, there is a, um, a comparison. That Jesus is much better than the angels who ever brought a message before. Uh, angels can often be translated messengers uh, in, your, in your New Testament. And there were angels who brought messages who, um, whether that be the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, whether that be an angel who spoke to somebody in their sleep or, or, or whatever it was, that, that somebody brought a message of the Lord uh, to people and spoke to people in particular. But now, see the transition. See, long ago he used to do, um, but... In these last days, verse 2, so a statement of transition. God used to do things a certain way, but now he does things differently. So you have to ask yourself, have you ever been in a situation where you say, Lord, if you would just speak to me, uh, I'm in a dire position. I, I'm hurt. I, don't, I have a whole lot of unknowns ahead of me, and I don't know what, I'm, what I need to do. And, and maybe you're like a lot of people in the world. You would say, if you would just speak to me. Would you please give me an audible word? Would you please put me at ease and say something? Let me know that you are there. And there were times in the Old Testament when he would do that. But now he speaks to all of us through Jesus. And he says, whom he is the heir of all things. And he has um, been appointed. And, and he was the creator of the world. And he abstains all things by the word of his power. See, he used to do things a certain way. But now Jesus is that way. Jesus is the way that God speaks to us today. The rest of this book is going to flesh out exactly how he does and exactly how he does speak to us. But it's important for us to know that at one time, God spoke at many portions, many times, different ways. But now he speaks to us through Jesus. If you were a Hebrew sitting there and you've been a Christian for 15 years you laid down Judaism you laid down the old law and the covenant and 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 the fathers and and the traditions and all of those things that you laid down and you followed Jesus you experienced some persecution there was no doubt I mean you experienced spiritual persecution from the Jews you experienced uh, physical persecution from the those of Rome that Christianity was uh, wasn't a sanctioned religion at the time. They saw it as just a sect of Judaism. And in some sense of the case, that's true. But, but you have to remember what these people were going through. These people were being uh, persecuted on all levels to forsake Jesus. And, and some did. And the point of this book is to say, don't. Jesus is better than anything that you've ever experienced before. And in particular, this chapter Jesus is better than any angel who ever came in times past and spoke to people. You see, they, the angelic beings were all through the Old Testament, and they, they love the thought of that, that God would send a message. But now God only speaks through Jesus' his Son. So this, this uh, lifts up Jesus. This picks Jesus up as he is. This elevates him to say God used to do things a certain way, but now the only way that he does it is through Jesus they had to be reminded of that. See, we, we go back to 1 Kings chapter 8. The people were reminded of how good God was to them. And so they went into their homes glad and, and joyful and, and, and loved. They, they loved their life and they loved their Lord. These Hebrews in this letter that we're going through, they had to be reminded, you know, Jesus is better than anything before. Jesus is better than, than the angels who brought messages uh, to our fathers. Yes, God did, but now 
think of the majesty that he places on Jesus. And even the text goes on to tell us. Now, let's, let's get to that text in Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 5 is where I want to pick up. He says, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? And if they were Hebrews listening, they would have known never at any point in time did he ever say that concerning one of those angelic beings. Verse, uh, he says, or again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. When did he ever say that? Well, he never did. Well, he continues on in verse 6. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, speaking of Jesus, when Mary gave birth to the child, he says, let all God's angels worship him. So he makes a transition that, that at what point in time did he, did he start talking to these angels this way? Well, he didn't. He only made mention of these words when the one of Mary was born, born of the Holy Spirit, conceived in the woman. He never said, let all the angels um, rejoice and worship another angel, but worship Jesus. In verse 7 of the angels, he says, He makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the sun, see there's a statement of transition. But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And I love in verse 14 where he, he goes ahead and says, Are they, speaking of the angels, not all ministering spirits? sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. Angels were meant to serve Jesus, and they are his. And so the Hebrews writer is painting a picture that Jesus was before all the angels, that Jesus was at creation. And yes, God spoke it many times in different ways. He spoke in the book of Leviticus. He spoke in the book of Jonah. But now he speaks in such a way in the completeness and fullness of communication through Jesus. What does that say about Jesus? God places the finite conversation, the infinite, the um, forever conversation on Jesus and not an angel. The angels were meant to serve and they needed to be reminded. Everything that came before was wonderful and it was as God wanted it to be, but it was only to bring about Jesus. It's my prayer that this study is beneficial to you in seeing that Jesus is greater than, than the angels who carried the messages before. You see, they need to be reminded, and, and so do we, that the times that we find ourselves that we say, you know, I wish you would audibly say something to me and, and put me at peace and put me at ease. What we're really doing is we're blaspheming God to say, your communication through Jesus isn't good enough. And although we may not mean that, that's what we're saying. So it's my prayer that we trust and rest in the fact that the way that God communicates to us today is sufficient and it's for my good and it's for his glory. And so with that, this lesson is yours. We love you here at Piedmont Road and we long to be together in the different ways that we're able and including this, this home group study. Uh, be sure to end this study with a prayer. Uh, conversate amongst yourselves. Draw out from the, the text the things that are in the lessons and and it's my prayer that this will be beneficial to you as it is to me. And it is sufficient as this is the will of our God.